Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are discussing U.S.-Russia relations with Katrina Vanden Heuvel. Katrina Vanden Heuvel is editorial director and publisher of The Nation magazine. See thenation.com. She is also vice president of the American Committee for U.S.-Russia Accord, a group interested in an informed dialogue about improving U.S.-Russia relations. The website is usrussiaaccord.com. Katrina Vanden Heuvel, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you, David, for having me on. Much appreciated. Uh, thank you for coming on, and thank you for wanting improved U.S.-Russia relations. Not too many people do. Um, you, you recently wrote in the Washington Post about the blocking of someone named Matthew Rajensky as Russia director on the U.S. National Security Council. Uh, who is he, and why does that matter? You know... Matthew Rajonsky is a young scholar, young in his 40s, and he runs something called the Kennan Institute in Washington, D.C. Very eminent think tank, uh, fellows work there. I had been on a panel with uh, Matt Rajonsky. He was the moderator of a panel sponsored by Just Foreign Policy and Acura. And we had Jerry Brown, we had Joe Serensoni, Cynthia Lazaroff, myself, and you know, Jerry Brown is a prophet, unarmed, armed. He's become quite fierce in his great concern about nuclear weapons. Matthew was very moderate. moderate. Um, he is someone who, in a sense, represents a kind of liberal center on national security issues, on U.S.-Russian relations. He's a realist. He believes in de-escalation of conflict in arms control treaties. These are not radical things. And I was shocked that Politico ran a piece about, you know, he's controversial. If Matthew Rajonsky is controversial, we are all in deep trouble. These are views that decades ago were like views Marshall Shulman, who was an assistant to Cy Vance in the Jimmy Carter administration, upheld, that there was an alternative to continuing to militarize relations. So I saw in Matthew Rajonsky and his baiting by groups who wanted someone more hawkish, a real problem in these times. He was to be a counter, by the way, to someone your listeners may have heard of, Victoria Nuland, who is controversial, is really a neo-lib, neo-con, and who is now in the, uh, on the national security, in the State Department. So you wanted a countervailing force. So it wasn't just Matt Rajonsky, but it was, hey, let's have a debate, at least in this country. Let's have a sense of what is not controversial so we can reach something more controversial, like really de-escalating conflict between two nuclear armed powers. Matthew Rajonsky is now um, aware that he's not going to get this position. There is a letter, I believe, going to be circulated by quite eminent Russianologists. Uh, so he's not alone. And someone like that, I think, can get more support, which then can be used for others who do take more controversial positions. But Jerry Brown, Governor Brown, said of Matthew Rajonsky, he's, you know, he's an interesting, moderate, cautious person. And I just rebel against the fact that we don't have a more full-throated, robust debate. Because tell me, David, isn't debate, different views, the marketplace of ideas, an all-American idea? And it's really been, I said one hand clapping, someone said it's not even that in our media in these last few years. I, I so, couldn't um, agree more. I, I mean, we, some of us did contribute, I think, to stopping Michelle Flournoy and Neera yes. Tandon and unsuccessfully tried to stop Victoria Nuland and we're still hoping to stop Rahm Emanuel. Should we have been more focused on supporting Matthew Rajonsky? It's interesting because he is, he has been kind of, he stepped back from some of the work our groups do, which doesn't mean you don't support when he's baited by uh, forces which want more militarism. But I do think, um, yes, I, you know, it was important. Roots Action played a good role. You did in ensuring Michelle Flournoy, who, you know, really what's legal should not be legal. The fact that she was on these boards, which were, you know, military industrial defense weapons boards is very, very uh, wrong. But um, in addition to stopping Michelle Flournoy, we should welcome, for example, Senator Sanders hearing. Uh, recent hearing on 
the Pentagon budget, because I think we need to really find ways to um, lay out to people how bloated it is, how it doesn't provide real security, and how the funds could be used to invest in our country, especially post-pandemic, real security. So I think Sanders is doing an important job. I think Mark Pocan, the representative from Wisconsin, who's in the Progressive Caucus, 100 strong, is part of a defense budget reduc reduction caucus with Barbara Lee. I think all of that is important and we should know about it and support it. At the same time, David, it's clear, you know, what is an indestructible weapon system? It's a weapon system that's in every district. We need to find alternative economic development modes because I fear our country was built in a kind of military Keynesianism. So we have to find a way to build down the ICBM, even though it does provide jobs and economic development. According to a very good Bulletin of Atomic Scientists story of, I think it was last month, why are we building a new trillion dollar weapon? And it was well reported, but it showed in communities, three or four in those country states, that money is like infrastructure money. Anyway, we need to address that, but we, we don't need to do is build up have more ICBMs, which are even by military scientists, others, viewed increasingly as not providing security, in fact, anti-security. And we need to listen more to people who understand the sleepwalking into nuclear danger is something we have to arouse people to, to really understand. And the more conflict there is, I wouldn't say we're looking at a war between the United States and Russia, but conflict, accidental conflict, skirmishes, you got, you know, so there's a set of real dangers that um, people should awaken to. And by the way, I wanted to note, I've been a, in, in terms of other things I do, yeah. I helped produce a movie coming out in June. It's a documentary, but a film about the making of the day after. If your listeners don't remember, and I don't blame them, they probably weren't even born, 1983, three hours on ABC, ABC most viewed program, even exceeding Super Bowls. And it contributed to the fact that there were a million people in Central Park protesting the international in, intermediate nuclear forces. It contributed to abolishing, for the first time in history, um, an entire weapon system, not just because of that documentary, but because film, three, ABC, but because you had in Reagan, someone who moved and in Gorbachev. So we can recall that time, and I hope this film will recall what is possible. What is possible? I, I could not agree more, uh, except maybe with the bit about missiles providing jobs and economic uh, stimulus. It's reality. I mean, they, but you can have more productive jobs. You know that. The jobs sure. provided by the defense industry are not the most well-paying. They don't contribute to improvement in communities. They sap, like casinos. Well, the, the, yeah, that's the point. It's actually a loss. If, if the, the studies that University of Massachusetts Amherst has done, it's not just you'd get better jobs and more of them with education or infrastructure or green energy, but if you didn't tax that money from working people in the first place, you'd have more jobs. So it's I, actually a loss. I love Perry. I think it's that center at University exactly. of Massachusetts Amherst. And I was in touch with its founder, Robert Pollan, and wrote a column for the Washington Post where I write once a week right. about just transition. But I focused on his work in Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia to help with coal industries and help with those industries, which are also, you know, people are left behind and that's not easy to do. I sit in New York City, bye, your job is gone. You know, people, it's not humane, but you do need to provide alternatives and we should be working on that and not working on more ICBMs. It should be a big part of the Green New Deal, which we should get. Yeah. Um, I, I, I wonder about this uh, so-called defense uh, spending reduction caucus, uh, not just their, uh, their, you know, clinging to the term defense, but, but there are never any requirements to join these caucuses. And I can't find the five members of the House that, w that would be necessary, or even one, who will publicly commit to voting no on any bill that funds over 90% of the current level of military. So I would rather one such member than a caucus with dozens of people signing press releases. All right, so let me give you, I have to disclose, I'm on the sister committee 
of the caucus. It's called the Progr Progr Progressive Caucus Center. It works with movements to amplify and give spine to the Progressive Caucus, which is now led by Pramila Jayapal. And in it, they have in the last couple months, David, put through new rules. So it's become a little more like a um, faction, a block in a parliamentary system. So you can't just join and then not vote two thirds of the time with the caucus, which was the problem. I can name five people, not enough. Bro Khanna, um, Barbara Lee, um, I mean, it, you know, and then who have um, publicly committed to voting against any bill that that increases. They, they have voted spending. against the war funding bills. They have also, as important in some ways, asserted the role of Congress in matters of war and peace. They've worked on the Yemen issues. They've worked on Afghanistan. I agree that uh, war budget, Pentagon budget is at the heart. Uh, but there are more and I'm blanking badly, but. It is not the strength of the caucus. I continue to try and explain that you see in Biden this divided kind of administration, right? I mean, I think on domestic issues, you can always do more, but there's some good work going on. There's some good appointments. But on the, on the national security um, foreign policy piece, it's a throwback. I mean, it's like a combination of some remnants of Clinton and Obama, and there's no new thinking at a time when we should be reimagining what national security means. Yeah. The caucus has started to think about foreign policy and global policy, but it's um, it does not have, and the left, David, to be honest, does not have a unified position on China, certainly not on Russia, but China is reemerging as a major challenge. And the money that is being rustled up, our defense correspondent, Michael Clare, just sent me a piece about the money that is going into building up some of these new weapon systems with China as a major threat. China's military budget is like one sixteenth of ours. I may get that wrong. I mean, Russia's is one, um, again, it's the wrong approach. I mean, what is security? So, yeah. Well, Russia's is that tiny and shrinking. China's shrinking. is, you know, approaching a third of the, the U.S., but if you compare China to U.S. and NATO members or China to U.S. and NATO members and partners and U.S. weapons customers, it's it's getting down below 15 uh, percent of the of that amount. Absolutely. Yeah. I was on an interesting call. Your listeners, I hope, might know about the Quincy Institute. Sure. It, it's it's very, it's quite good. It's, you know, more realist than progressive. But that line between the two, I mean, I think progressive realism is important because they're saying we should get our own home in order before we go out and preach and do empire. And they had a good session yesterday about what is NATO's, does NATO have any role today? You know, I think when NATO was debated, expansion of NATO in 1997, you had hawks signing on to say, why are we expanding? Today or a year ago, if you had said NATO expansion, why? You would have been called it. Trump puppet or a Putin puppet, right? I mean, it's mm -hmm. that kind of stigmatizing and baiting. It's hard to say red baiting because red has become red and blue, but it's stigmatizing alternative points of view that lead people to go quiet because of, you know, they don't want to be branded. And I think that's dangerous. I think, again, there is important an important debate to be had about why are we expanding NATO? You know, I mean, Ukraine, by the way, which I think is a critical situation. Blinken was there recently. Ukraine is not going to be resolved by military means. Ukraine is a country with a divided past, um, and it's going to need one of these kind of diplomatic, if we can use that word, agreements with security guarantees and other. And um, more military and more U.S. involvement is not going to provide that security. And the foreign minister of, of Russia, Lavrov, uh, was speaking recently, not just against alliances like NATO, but against new proposals from France and from, from Joe Biden for a gathering of the democracies, whatever those may be, uh, as, as skirting around the United Nations and creating extra legal uh, coalitions uh, and, and denouncing this sort of outlaw behavior. Uh, 
it's troubling because I don't think at this stage in our history, as we continue to try and fulfill that more perfect union, that we should be in the business of deciding who will be in the democratic club. You want to make sure that democracy, whatever, I mean, I consider democracy sort of the um, declaration, um, you know, Eleanor Roosevelt's internet, the Declaration of Human Rights, where there's civil rights, political rights, economic rights. And I think to divide the world into democracies and authoritarian countries, who's going to be deciding that? I, again, think we get our home in order. And, you know, it is Sergei Lavrov. He is the foreign minister of Russia. He's experienced. You can take it with a grain of salt, but he did give an important speech at the United Nations, a body, by the way, that is too often set aside when we don't want it. But it's an important body by virtue of many of the organizations like the International Labor Organization, et cetera. But uh, I thought Lavrov was quite interesting in arguing that why are we now privileging this idea of um, liberal rules-based world order? It's sort of what the United States decides or Europe, as opposed to the body of international law that has you know, kind of stabilized the Actual world. Actual written rules. Yeah, and I think there is something going on, which I don't think is going to end well. Um, we already a... have NATO, which is, you know, dividing militarily. And by the way, people should know, David, NATO was a response to the Warsaw Pact, the Soviet East European military alliance. It wasn't just a coffee clutch. I mean, it is a military alliance and like members yeah. have to buy weapons and, and, you know, it could have been something different. It could have been OSCE, which is a European organization, or as Gorbachev, someone I greatly admire, he's 90, he's still thinking and writing, had hoped it could have been a common European home stretching from Lisbon to Vladivostok. You know, I mean, the whole European without sure. a military. I think, I think Russia would have joined at points if they had been allowed. Um, yeah. But there was a poll this week or last week, uh, people in, I think, 50 some countries, 44% uh, of them thought the United States was a threat to democracy, 38% China and 28% Russia. So if you're going to decide by those means, the United States actually isn't going to make the cut that Russia and China are into the club of of pro-democracy nations. So yeah. uh, I, I guess don't decide it democratically in any case. Um, yeah. But I, 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 I know that I know who the best members of the U.S. Congress are. There isn't any mystery. I know that Ro Khanna and Barbara Lee and Mark Barbara Cohen, Lee, and these are the best. And, and I know that they did things to try to end the war on Yemen right. when they could count on a veto from Donald Trump. Uh, They've pushed but Biden. why? Why in the heck can they not? Neither house that passed ending the war on Yemen twice when they could count on a veto. Why can't they do it when they supposedly would be appreciated and applauded by the new president of the other party? Why can't they do it now? You mean in terms of the quote war budget or? No, a war powers resolution by Congress to end the war on Yemen completely and utterly and, and think, all aligned with and arming and training and, and maintenance and information supplying two parties in that war, uh, which both houses of Congress passed twice in the previous yeah. uh, Congress. And it was vetoed by Donald right, Trump. And now, uh, here you get a new president should, and you get Congress members talking about the crisis escalating and the deaths piling up and we need to end the war on Yemen. And the president now would supposedly say, oh, thank you. But, you know, not a sign no, of life. Listen, I think um, there has been more life in the body politic of Congress uh, for too many, too many years, decades, David. The imperial, you know, the imperial presidency, the executive branch, led Congress to be more and more sort of calcified in its willingness to assume the power that is vested in it. I think some of what has happened here, you know, the House passed some great bills. You know, I kept telling people, if we can get the House and the Senate, you have some amazing bills. The Senate is such a squeaker and the House is now a squeaker. It is possible that if the Senate had been five, six seats, some of that legislation in the House might not have been put forward as quickly. I mean, some of it was legislating in the belief that it wouldn't pass, not to be cynical. But I don't exactly. know why Congress has not moved. I don't know if it's a matter of giving executive prerogative to Biden in the first hundred or so days. But there should be movement. 
And I do think there are core people who are really engaged in trying to move the House. Like my colleague, someone I admire, Eric Sperling, at Just Foreign Policy. I think he's very strategic and he knows how to work the House and the legislative maneuver, and he knows how to work the green. But you still need numbers, and that's been an issue. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I hate to be skeptical. I know I'm not the most patient and understanding. Listen, it takes movements, David, though. It takes, if not a million people in Central Park saying, you know, let's move on this. But, you know, you know, politicians, that famous story, which is kind of apocryphal about Roosevelt, go out and make me do it. I mean, you have Sidney Hillman or Francis Perkins or A. Philip Randolph, and no one at the Hyde Park archives has been able to find this statement. But, you know, it takes movements, which is why we do what we do in a way. It takes media pressure, it takes movement pressure to push people to understand what they might not naturally do. But you know, with the, when the movements get going for a couple of years, then all of a sudden everybody tells us the movements need elections. And all the money and all the energy go into the elections. And we back, you know, the better candidates and they influence, quote unquote, influence the worst candidates and they make better promises than they otherwise would have. Um, I, I think you, your most recent column, uh, Katrina Vanden Heuvel in the Washington Post uh, had a headline, progressives and Biden are off to a strong start. Will it last? I, I just let me I know. let me make the let me make the opposite case well, for fifty seconds, and you tell me where I'm where I'm wrong. Uh, even just Joe Biden's promises, never mind what I actually want. We were supposed to have the wars on Yemen and Afghanistan ended by the president. We were supposed to have the money moved out of the military. Deportations ended for a hundred days. A fifteen dollar minimum wage. Paid sick and family leave, expanded voting rights, including for people convicted of felonies, campaign finance reform, free community college, free public college for families making under 125000 forgiveness of student debt at public colleges, universal preschool, the so-called public option for health care, lowered age for Medicare, pathway to citizenship, ban on assault weapons, ban on union busting, ban on so-called new fracking, tax penalty for offshoring, cap removed from the Social Security taxes. I mean, I, I can go on for you dozens. Can go on. We, as but far as know, I know, we haven't gotten any of these things. David, you know, first of all, let's take empowering labor rights. There is a bill put out, pro, the PRO Act, which is as good a piece of labor legislation, labor rights legislation, that has been seen in decades. Now, can he pass it? Mm -hmm. He's probably facing a Joe Manchin problem on that one, too. It's not just um, Republicans. But I agree with you that we're not getting everything we want. We are with the CARE bill, the human infrastructure piece, beginning cuts in child poverty, beginning possibilities of child care, though it should be vested and invested in for decades, not just a year. There is no question, though I'm surprised by Joe Biden, I have to say, I think the pandemic has moved him, the crises, economic crises. Who thought Joe Biden would move even this to this extent, David? I mean, he's appointed some good people and there are movements that are, you know, not as fast like climate. Um, but I do think economically, you know, some of the tax cuts should be much broader and bigger, but it's a constant tussle, David, between outside power and its demands and electing those who are, at, let's put it this way, the left wing of the possible. I'm not talking about AOC, but do take a look. I would say 15 years ago where I sat at the nation, a lot of people pitted movement politics versus electoral politics. I think it's important that you have movement people running. Jamal Bowman, maybe not movement, but a principal of uh, high school, um, replaced Elliot Engel, Possible beginnings, Elon Omar, um, Alana Presley. Um, you know, it's not just AOC, and it's not just uh, Jamal. And I think I'm. I was on a call yesterday. The important race your listeners should know about next week is in Philadelphia, where Larry Krasner has been a progressive district attorney. There is a movement of district attorneys across this country, which I find powerful because it does affect formerly incarcerated people. It you know it really speaks to you know, what we witness with the Floyd killing, the police, it begins to speak to that. Yeah. So I'm a, I, I'm not a booster. I'm a realistic supporter of what movements do they do. 
and you push politicians. And if they have ties to movements, they're better. You're better able to push them. There's, there's no question. And I may be too much be. of a realist, and I may believe too often in the importance of coalition building. I, you know, you work with people you don't necessarily agree with on everything. Um, I may be too compromising. I may be someone who is not a movement person fully, because in movements it seems to me you have to keep that sharp radical edge, uh, and not compromise, because you need to push people to go to the edge. I could not agree more. We've got about two and a half minutes left, and I just wonder, all these great bills being introduced don't save a single life, and I don't see an actual effort to get rid of the filibuster. I see a reliance on the filibuster. Where are the carrots and sticks being applied to Senators Manchin and Cinema? I mean, when, when Dennis Kucinich took a stand against the Obamacare legislation, they pulled out every possible carrot and stick until that, they brought him around, right? They don't do that to the right. They do that to the left. Where's, where's, the, where's the real effort? I, I will say, though, I think the pivot has shifted. I'm not saying this is a Roosevelt moment. We don't know. But it's not not just that. I think the pivot has shifted so that the left has more authority. But is it the case if Dennis was still in Congress, he would get nailed, you know? And Manchin seems to float around in cinema. Um, I think what we're witnessing, David, is also just the limits of a progressive left's understanding of the systemic limits, racism of our system. How, we haven't paid attention to the filibuster in years. We, we didn't pay enough attention to the courts, David. Now there's at least an awareness of the underpinnings of a system. Filibuster, gerrymandering, voting rights that, you know, um, that needs to be addressed. And the states are so vital. We're coming in late uh, and it should be, you know, that Manchin gets the treatment Dennis did, not Dennis, because he was, he was someone, by the way, who was unfailingly true. Yeah, he was. But there are not many like that. I mean, you know, Tulsi Gabbard, I admired her and disagreed with her on things and agreed with her on things, but she was more complicated. And that's what happens when you can't always have what you want in a political figure. But she was someone who, on certain key issues we've been talking about, was courageous in speaking out. Um, yeah. Well, there are a dozen or so new ones who are who are in some ways Elon up to Omar. this level. Even, and, Elon Omar has been quite, you know. Elon Omar is, is one of the best. Adam Smith's challenger, Stephanie Gallardo, could be one of the best. They're new ones who keep who keep running. Um, we I wish we could go on. Uh, we're out of minutes. We've been speaking with Katrina Vanden Heuvel, who is editorial director and publisher of The Nation magazine, which is at thenation.com, and also vice president of the American Committee for U.S.-Russia Accord, which has a, a wonderful website collection of articles, better than a better than a newspaper. Go to <laughs> usrussiaaccord.com. Com. Katrina, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you, David. Much appreciated. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at Talk World Radio. Dot org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.